Good morning, everyone. Welcome to National Fossil Day at the Harvard Museum of Natural History. My name is Ariel, and I'm one of the educators at the museum. We're so glad you could be with us today. This morning, we're going to be talking to Sarah Loso and Steve Pates. Sarah, do you want to give us a wave? Hi, Sarah. Sarah is a PhD candidate in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology and a member of the Ortega Hernandez Lab for Invertebrate Paleontology. All right, Steve, do you want to give us a wave? Hi, Steve. Steve is a postdoctoral fellow also in the Ortega Hernandez Lab. Today, they're going to be discussing fossil invertebrates, including some amazing, weird animals. And they're going to be thinking about how fossils like these help us understand not just the animals themselves, but also the history of the Earth. So before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit about how this webinar will work. If you've never been on a Zoom webinar before, it might look a little different from the Zoom that you're used to. One of the big differences is that you can see us, but we can't see you. So that means if you want to talk to us or ask us questions, you can use the question and answer feature on your screen. You'll be able to see the questions that other people have asked. And if there's a question that someone else asked that you really like, you can hit that little thumbs up button next to the question to upvote it and let us know that you really want us to answer it. So now we'd like to learn a little bit more about you. And we have a poll for you to answer. So the poll question asks, uh, who is watching today? And your choices are just me, a fossil loving kid, just me, a fossil loving grown up, a whole family of fossil lovers, or a classroom of fossil lovers. We'll wait just a minute to give everyone a chance to answer. All right. It looks like we have a lot of grown-ups with us today. We also have some families and a few classrooms. So that is fantastic. And we have some kids. So I'm going to turn it over to Steve and Sarah. Um, and before we do that, we just have one final question for you. And this one is not a poll question. So you can actually just type your answer into the question and answer box. And it's, do you have a favorite fossil? See if anyone writes their favorite fossils. Oh, someone says Deinonychus is their favorite. See if anyone else wants to answer. Oh, trilobites, but also this person likes all of them. Someone else likes trilobites as well. That's fantastic. Trilobites are super cool. Ooh, crinoids. Oh, it's something that I don't know, but I bet Sarah and Steve know. Not to, not tungulates. Ooh, super. Ah, uh, T-Rex and trilobites and crinoids. Wonderful. This is exciting because a lot of these things are things that Sarah and Steve will be mentioning. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah and Steve now. And if you have any more questions for us, please ask them as we go along and I'll let Steve and Sarah know. Okay. So it was great to see everyone's favorite fossil because a lot of those will be discussed today. So I'm Sarah and I study trilobites and their close relatives to help understand um, the early evolution of arthropods. And uh, I'm Steve and I study Cambrian soft bodied animals, uh, which include relatives of trilobites, uh, mainly from the United States. And we already went through that and a lot of you like trilobites, which you will see plenty of today. So just first um, to get a, a sense of setting. So here on the, the left, we have the geologic time scale. We live up here in the Quaternary. So this is everything that's very recent from the last 2 million years. Um, for reference, the dinosaurs 
um, or at least the cool dinosaurs, lived in the Mesozoic period. So that ended 65 million years ago. Um, but we're going to be talking about really old fossils from the Ordovician and the Cambrian, which is between 542 million years to 444 million years ago. So much longer ago than the dinosaurs, just for reference. And it was great to see a bunch of invertebrates occupying the favorite fossil chat because we love invertebrates, uh, we both study them, and most animals today are invertebrate animals. So they don't have a backbone like we do, instead they either don't have a backbone at all or they have an external skeleton. And so a lot of the fossil record is invertebrates as well, not only because they're everywhere and they're, they're by far the most abundant animals on the planet, but also because of this hard shell. So that's the reason we see a lot of trilobites out there as well. But they don't just tell us about what was there. They also tell us about the orientation of the paleo continents, the ecology, the diversity of the world, and also about the history of evolution. So they're not just cool because they're everywhere, but also because they're really informative and exciting. And some of the types of fossils that you might see, you could see shells. So that would be something like, here I have a shell that's been cut in half, or you could have um, bones and those either shells or bones can show the entire body of a organism. So here we have an entire trilobite or an entire sauropod, but you could also have bones or shells that are just parts of organisms. So. This is a fossil of a whale's ear. So I'm holding a whale, but only part of it. So sometimes you get the whole organism and sometimes you only get part of it. And you could also have fossils that are just things like trackways. And those are gonna show us behaviors, but not actually the body of the organism. So the fossils can be wide ranging in what they are and how they're, they're made. Now we wanted to ask another poll question. So this should pop up for you and you can answer. Have you ever gone fossil hunting? So yes, no, or I want to. And we'll give you a minute to respond. Okay, so it looks like lots of people have already gone fossil hunting or and lots of people really want to. So what we wanted to start off with was just some of the common fossils that you might find if you went fossil hunting around New England. So you could find something like a belemnite, which I have examples of here, and they kind of, they just look like pens basically, but they are actually the internal shell of something like a squid. And they're really common. Um, so you can find those easily and find this, these squid fossils. You could find a close, a relative of theirs, which is the ammonite, which is super cool and very pretty when you find them and cut them in half. Sometimes they have <clears throat> geodes formed inside of them. So you get crystals as well. And those are Again, relatives of squid and octopi, there would have been a little critter that sat in here with tentacles hanging out and they would have swam around. So those are pretty easy to find. You might find something like a bivalve. So here we have a scallop or you could find a clam or you could find something like this one down here. This is called a devil's toenail. Um, and they're really easy to find because they have this huge thick shell. So they preserve really well and you can find them. But if you are go out and you find something that is bivalved, it's not necessarily a mollusk. So those clams and sc scallops, it might be a brachiopod, which today there's only a couple species left. Um, but they were really common in the Paleozoic and they have a different plane of symmetry and they'll have this little hole where a peduncle came out to hold on to the sediment or the, the rock that they lived on. 
So if you find a bivalve, it's either going to be a brachiopod or a bivalved organism. Another common kind of organism you could find is echinoderms. So these are going to be relatives of uh, either sea stars or sand dollars. Um, and they'll often have this little test with five point symmetry. That's an echinoderm. So those are some of the fossils you might find if you went out in New England. Now, I, I know the answer to this one. Um, have you ever heard of a trilobite? And definitely some of you already have because it's your favorite fossil. It's my favorite fossil too, so. Oh my God, yes. This is great. So many people know what trilobites are. This is making my day. So just to show you some of the diversity of trilobites, um, they are these fossils from the Paleozoics with over 20,000 described species. Um, and they're from the early Cambrian all the way through the, the Permian. So they have a really long record and there's tons of them because they have this thick calcite exoskeleton, so they preserved really well. But you can see that trilobites did some crazy things. Um, some of them have forks on their, their faces. Not quite sure what they were doing, but they have forks. Um, and this one also has spines coming off of its eyes. Some of them get really spiny. Um, some of them evolve massive eyes that actually needed these little sun shades over them to help them see. Some of them were swimming, some of them scuttled along the bottom, um, and they could all, almost all of them could enroll like this. So when they're threatened, they just kind of roll up like a roly-poly so that all the soft bits are protected and it's all exoskeleton. Oh, Sarah, someone had a question. They are wondering if you have a favorite trilobite. I don't like to pick favorites. Um, it's really, I I like the ones I'm working on usually. Like, so this one over here, this is a Flexi Calamini and I work on those. I also work on one called Olenoides serratus, which is from the Burgess Shale, which is currently like my baby. So I'm really fond of it. But those really spiny ones from Morocco are really awesome. So it's, it's hard. I, my favorite changes. <laughs> Thank you. That sounds great. <laughs> but we're going to quickly jump in here and show you some some of the largest trilobites out there. So this one is from Braintree in Massachusetts, so pretty close to the MCC. And if we just bring up the baseball to scale, we can Oops. see that um, this guy was pretty sizable back in the Cambrian Ocean. Um, so there are some pictures of on, on the internet. You can see like these uh, local quarry workers just digging these things out and there's just, they're just everywhere and huge. But not just being largest animals in the Cambrian Ocean, they also tell us something about where the paleo continents used to be. So this guy, remember, is Paradoxites. And then if we flick to the next one, we can see two other pretty large and sizable trilobites. On the left, we have Olonellus from Pennsylvania. And on the right, we have Paradoxites davidis, so a different species of this trilobite, which is found in both Newfoundland and Wales. So we can see from this that, you know, Wales and Newfoundland are separated by a pretty large ocean today. And are fairly distant from Braintree, Massachusetts. However, Olenellis, Pennsylvania is pretty close to Massachusetts today. But if we roll the, the clock back 500 million years ago, we see that uh, Olenellis is up there in Laurentia, um, which is on the equator. And that's where most of the United States was uh, in, the, in the late Cambrian. However, New England is down there in the Southern hemisphere um, and very close back in the day to where England and Wales were. So these trilobites have actually helped us to trace back and work out where the continents used to be back in the day, half a billion years ago. So another poll question for you. We've shown you a bunch of fossils so far, but what is most commonly preserved in these fossils? Is it bones and shells, soft tissue, hair, or behaviors?
Yeah, so we're, we got a lot of votes for bones and shells and a lot of votes for behavior. So bone and shell is correct. Those are the most common. Um, so with mammals, it's usually teeth, um, which can be really tiny, so it's hard to study. And then with invertebrates, what you mostly get are shells. So like the brachiopods or the tests of echinoderms or the trilobite exoskeleton. So those are really common. But you can actually get preservation of things like hair, which you might not expect. So this is a mammoth. So it's not quite a fossil. Um, it's a subfossil. But you can see that there's hair on it. And in some um, mammal fossils, you actually get preservation of hair on the fossils. So we can see those. And you can also get preservation of feathers, which is very cool. And you can definitely get preservation of behaviors with those trace fossils. So here, um, this would be made by something like a trilobite. Um, you get them like scuttling quickly over the sediment or kind of burrowing down into it or really burrowing down and they just sit in the sediment and move their legs a lot. So we can see what they're doing. But the part we want to talk about next is that soft tissue preservation, which is anything that is squishy. So like any flesh or skin would be soft tissue. And you might think that's going to be really hard to preserve because it doesn't seem right to preserve that. But in the 1860s and 70s in upstate New York in Trenton Falls, this man, a very young Charles Walcott, made a discovery of trilobites with soft tissue preservation. Um, so these are in specimens of trilobites that are enrolled. So there was a turbinite, so a, a mass movement of water with a lot of sediment in it. And the trilobites were upset by that. So they rolled up um, and they unfortunately got killed by the, the movement. But as they enrolled, they got filled with mud and it preserved the soft tissue. So here, this is a trilobite, and you're looking at it like transversely. And we can actually see the gills of it. And this is an eye, just for a reference. And then in some other specimens, you can see their walking legs and their gills. So this is great because we don't normally get that preservation, and it really helps us figure out how these were moving, how they were behaving, what they were eating. So here, these are nathabases um, here. And that would be just spines to crush up their food and then pass it toward the mouth. And we can see, oops, the wrong way. This would be the gill for respiration so that they're breathing when they're in water. So the soft tissue preservation really helps us kind of flesh out what we know about these organisms. So this, the Shelley fossil record that we have been talking about gives you this kind of perspective on the world of there's some shelly things, there are some trilobites. Sometimes we can figure out more about the trilobites. But it's a really incomplete look because there are a ton of organisms that are entirely soft bodied and they wouldn't get preserved in the shelly fossil record. And if you don't include those, your image of the world is inaccurate. So here, um, not a lot going on up top, but down below there's things swimming around and eating each other and it's a more dynamic world. And that's because just, just like today, half a billion years ago, most of what was alive was soft. So it wouldn't be preserved except with this exceptional preservation. And so on the left here, we have Charles Walcott again, uh, this time up in Canada, uh, standing in- And as an old man. And uh, an older Walcott standing in Canada, doing a classic pose that down the years, future paleontologists tend to recreate. Um, and so this quarry is known as the Walcott Quarry, and just above it, um, yet to be dug out, is the Raymond Quarry, which is where the Museum of Paradisology's collection of Burgess Shale fauna come from, because this is the Burgess Shale fauna. And so when Walcott started digging in this quarry, he found a lot of things that are actually completely soft and are relatives of uh, modern animals, despite the fact that they look pretty strange. Um, so on the left, we've got uh, an arthropod, so a relative of trilobites and also like modern uh, crabs and spiders and scorpions. And you can see it's got a very spiny head shield and then a segmented body, which is a classic arthropod feature. And at the back, we see that kind of dark patch, which is where it pooped out its last meal when it was squashed and became a fossil. Uh, if we head across the middle, we're going to drop 
briefly into our closest ancestors half a billion years ago, uh, which, you know, it's a pretty attractive look. This is um, Vicaya, which is a, an early chordate. So it's got an early kind of backbone uh, running along its midline, but otherwise it's a pretty simple kind of fish-like animal. Over on the right-hand side, um, we have a relative of a modern squid and the belemnite and ammonite that you saw earlier. So this is nectaricus, which is kind of a bag with a bag with some tentacles and some eyes, um, which you know you can't imagine being preserved except with ex very exceptional preservation. And then if we head towards the bottom, we've got hallucigenia, which is an animal so weird it's described upside down and back to front. And the, the name hallucigenia tells you how strange, strange looking it is. And then you look at it and you see it's got those elongate paired spines along its back and those very slender, delicate legs. Um, and so we're seeing a very diverse and wild fauna coming out from Canada half a billion years ago. But similar animals have been discovered in the United States as well. Um, and so on the left hand side, we can see a small isoxus. So this is like an animal with a um, very simple uh, bivalve shell. Um, and two spines coming out, one out the front, one out the back. And you see there's a quarter of a scale underneath it. You can see how small this animal is. And this is from the Kinses Formation in Pennsylvania, which is the same place that that um, Olinellus trilobite I showed you earlier was from. Um, and so we've got swimming arthropods in Pennsylvania. And on the right-hand side, we have an animal that's only known from Utah, which is a type of radiodont, so a relative of Anomalocaris, so one of those you know, feared animals in the, in the Cambrian Sea uh, half a billion years ago. So at the front, we've got its mouth with those huge teeth around the central square area. And then just below it, we've got these feeding appendages, which we would use to scoop up whatever it fancied for dinner that day. Um, and if you look at the size of the quarter, you see that these guys are pretty big um, and we'd have them swimming around um, with the reconstruction, sorry, Sarah. Um, with the, have them swimming around with these uh, mouths, you can just see underneath those appendages and on the left-hand side, the much smaller and delicate isoxus. So these fossils in America uh, are both similar to those in the Burgess Shale, in that we get this exceptional preservation in some common animals, but also the ones we're seeing here are only known from the United States. So we're seeing exceptional preservation of an interesting and unique fauna. But we don't only get the outside, we also sometimes get the insides. So this is also from Utah. Uh, it's another arthropod and we can see um, we have a look at where its eyes are and its mouth at the front. Um, we've got this pair of eyes adjacent to a mouth. But we also see the gut running down the middle. So this is a kind of distinct patch with distinct preservation from the rest of the animal. And then either side of the gut, we have its paired, uh, paired nerve, nerve cord going up into the brain where we see these dark strands heading towards the eyes and also to the legs along the animal. So we're, we're seeing this amazing level of detail in these soft fossils, which is just not possible from the Shelley record. And I think this is our, our last poll question. Um, so we showed you all of those soft tissue, soft um, preservation, um, but we have this huge fossil record of shelly things. So why would organisms want to make a hard shell or something? Because that takes a lot of energy and a lot of work and it's a big investment. So why would they bother with that? I mean, it's great for us because it means we get to find them in the fossil record, but um, yes. <laughs> they, weren't, they probably weren't thinking of us. <laughs> All right, we've got some great answers there. Um, and really, in a way, kind of everyone's, everyone's a winner, everyone's right. These are all different ideas that have been put forward as to why animals may have uh, developed and improved upon their hard exoskeletons. Um, so the muscle support, as, you, as, you, as some of you suggested, would provide a strong, uh, strong base for the muscles to attach to and help them scuttle or swim in the, in the oceans. And changing seawater has been suggested to be, maybe be, be, a, be, be toxic for the animals back in the day. And so actually they were pulling out the calcium from the seawater to basically stop themselves from poisoning themselves. So like the skeleton was a byproduct of basically just trying to stay alive. The idea that an exoskeleton was, or a hard shell was good for stopping predation, well, it kind of makes sense today because you know, when you've got your seafood in, you have to crack through the, the, the shells to get to the nice delicious uh, soft parts in the middle. And for the trilobites as well, it's been suggested because, well, some of them grow pretty big. We've seen a lot of spines. These look like things that are meant to put off a predator. But it doesn't always work 
quite how you plan. So this is um, Paradoxides, this one's from Newfoundland, and it's about, you know, about 10 inches long. And we can see on the left-hand side, there's a huge semicircular chunk taken out of it. So this animal's growing big, and it's growing a hard shell, and a predator has still managed somehow to take a big chunk out of it. So this is kind of telling us about not just why they're growing hard exoskeletons, but also about the prey that in this case, we haven't found. We don't know what caused this bite, but we know that predators at that time were able to do it. So we're seeing this continual, like, the, the prey animals get stronger and harder and faster and bigger, and the predators adapt and evolve to stay in the competition and stay in the race. And this has been put forward as a, a leading driver of evolution in, in the history of animal life. And we're seeing this in the fossil record here. So just to sum up our presentation, the invertebrate fossil record is amazing and super cool. Um, they can tell us about how the world used to be, um, so where continents used to be, what kind of organisms were around, what groups were around. They're great because you can find them pretty much anywhere um, in various degrees. Sometimes you find just those shelly fossils. Sometimes you find really amazing soft tissue preservation, but all fossils are cool and you can find them very easily. Those soft tissue deposits are rare, but are really informative to help us fill out what we know about these, um, these organisms. So like, what were they eating? How were they living? When did nervous systems evolve? So those are really helpful. But overall, the invertebrate fossils help us learn about biology, um, how, where the continents were and continental tectonics ecology and interactions between organisms, like who is eating who, and the biodiversity at the time, and of course, the trajectories of evolution. So are there any questions? So a few people have asked questions that I'd love to pass on to you. And if anyone else has any questions, please ask them. So one person was asking some about something that I don't know what it is, but you probably do. Agnostids, are they currently considered trilobites? So the, <laughs> the last um, phylogeny I saw had them as the closest relatives of trilobites, but they didn't include them in trilobites. Um, Steve, so should we briefly like is... sum up kind of what an agnostid is? Yeah. So it's basically very, very small and in the past was considered a trilobite because it has this hard exoskeleton uh, with a head, three segments in the thorax, so in the body, and then kind of a tail. And the tail and the head pretty much match up kind of one to one in terms of size, which you do see in some trilobites as well. So based on just the exoskeletons, people were like, hey, these guys look like weird trilobites, let's call them trilobites. But then there was some exceptional fossils found uh, basically preserving uh, the larvae of these things with the appendages preserved in three dimensions. And the appendages looked pretty different to what we see in, in trilobites. And then I think it was last year, again, there was some Burgess shale fossils actually, which also had the limbs preserved. And the limbs again, didn't quite match up with what was, what was found in the previous uh, fauna from Sweden with the 3D preservation, but also didn't really match up with trilobites either. So the kind of Currently, the evidence is kind of leaning towards them being relatives of trilobites, but not true trilobites. Um, but that is currently an area of ongoing research and debate. So, um, you know, stay tuned. <laughs> Very cool. So someone else is wondering what kind of trilobite is on the screen right now? Oh, I can't remember its name. Steve, do you remember? I don't remember its <laughs> name. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess it's from Morocco, though. All right. So those are the the spiny ones are usually uh, um, Devonian and Morocco. Cool. Um, someone else has been asking about. I think it must be a book called. Well, let's see if I can find that question now. Uh, Pagu. Does anyone know what this is? No. It sounds like this might be a book or maybe. Um, uh, something else that features characters that are similar to some of these invertebrates, which is very cool. And a few people are wondering if you have any suggestions for where to look for fossils in New England. So if you want to find 
trackways, um, Western Mass and like the Connecticut Valley is great. Um, you can find dinosaur tracks all over. Um, if you want to, so the trilobites that Steve showed are from the Boston area. Um, but the one they're specifically from is now built over. So, but if you look around, it would be exposed elsewhere. There are Ediacaran fossils on one of the, um, the Boston islands, but those are way less exciting because they just kind of look like an impression. Um, but so for to find some like Shelley fossils, I would have to look up like specifically where is good because one of the issues with New England is everywhere is forested. Mm -hmm. So ideally for fossil hunting, you want exposed rock, which is harder in New England because we have forest over everything. But so you would need to find um, rock cliffs or exposed rock somewhere. Interesting. All right. So Thank you so much, Steve and Sarah. It was wonderful to have you here with us today. Um, we have two more webinars scheduled for today. And if you're interested in attending those, you can check them out on our website. You can also look at our website for more virtual event opportunities coming up in the future. So I just wanna thank all of you for being here with us today. Have a great afternoon.